Hello, everyone. Welcome to Friday First Chapters, where I'll be reading the first chapters of four library books. If you're interested in reading them, you may come in and check them out. It's just a teaser so that you might maybe find a new genre that you enjoy. So the first book I'm going to read is called Magic on the Map, and it's called Let's Move. My RV doesn't do that. It's by Courtney Scheinmel and Bianca Turetsky. I'll read you a little bit about it. Magic and mystery from sea to shining sea. We must be dreaming. That's what twins Finn and Molly Parker think when they discover a camper in their driveway. And it talks. When the camper transports them to a cattle ranch in Colorado, the twins know something magical has happened. Then the camper disappears, leaving Molly and Finn to wonder, how are we going to get home? The book is a stepping stone book. And this is for... Um, um, patrons that are just beginning to read beyond the um, sight word books that we have here, the early chapter books. Chapter one, driveway surprise. And I like that they have all over the continent where they might be going. On the last day of second grade, Finn and Molly Parker came home to find a camper in their driveway. It was white with one orange stripe and one yellow stripe. It had a rounded roof and three windows on the sides. The twins checked to make sure the school bus had let them off at the right house. Yep, this was 24 Birchwood Drive. with its hunter green mailbox out front and purple Johnny jump up flowers in the window boxes. But you couldn't see the window boxes now. They were blocked by the camper, which is, was as big as a boat. Molly turned to Finn. What's this doing here, she asked. How would I know, Finn asked. I just got here same as you. Molly and Finn walked up the driveway slowly and carefully as if the camper were a UFO. Finn was wearing his favorite baseball cap. It was from his little league team, the Moonwalkers, and he never took it off. Well, not never. He took it off at school because hats were not allowed during class. And he took it off each night when he had to shower before bed. But every other minute of the day, he wore it, even when he was sleeping. Except right now, he took the hat off and shielded his eyes with his hand peeking through the camper's tinted windows. Their dad jumped out of the driver's side door. Ah, the twins yelled in surprise. Dad, you scared us, Finn said. What are you doing home? And what's this, Molly added. It's a camper. Isn't it beautiful, Mr. Parker said, and he patted the side of the camper as if it were a new puppy. Now we could take the trip we've always dreamed of taking. What trip, Finn asked. A family road trip, their dad exclaimed. We can go anywhere where our hearts desire. That's not true. We can't go to Bora Bora, Molly said. Huh, Finn asked. Bora Bora is an island in Tahiti. Molly said it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which means we can't drive there. Anywhere we can travel in the camper has to be on this continent. That's right, Molly, their dad said. Can't get anything past you, but, excuse me, <laughs> getting over a cold. But there are lots of other places these wheels can take us this summer. Um, we can go anywhere in North America. Doesn't that sound great? I get car sick, Molly said. Remember the time we drove to Grandma's house and I threw up all over Finn? I remember, Finn said. I was. It was so disgusting. I didn't do it on purpose, Molly replied. But you didn't have to do it on me, Finn said. Do you get camper sick too? Probably, Molly said. Gross, Finn said, placing his cap back on his head. Kids, where's that Parker family spirit, their dad asked. And just then, Mrs. Parker stepped out of the front door, her cell phone pressed to her ear. 
Her eyes widened at the sight of a camper in her driveway. Carol, I'm going to have to call you back, she said, and she lowered the phone and shook her head. What in the world? Family vacation, honey, Parker said. Mrs. Parker's eye scanned the driveway. Where's your car? Well, I traded with Professor Vega in the astro astrophysics department, Mr. Parker exclaimed. It was the deal of steal of a deal. The car sat only five, and this camper sleeps eight. Oh, no, Mrs. Parker said. You have to trade back. This takes up the entire front yard, and it's crushing my poor magnolias. Whew. Molly and Finn sighed with relief. The camper would be returned tomorrow. Dad would get his regular old car back. Everything would be normal again. But that night, Molly couldn't fall asleep. She tossed and turned until there was a faint morning light peeking through her window. Molly put on her fuzzy bunny slippers and carefully tiptoed down the stairs. She wanted to look at that camper one last time and maybe go inside it before Dad traded it back. She couldn't get car sick or camper sick if it was standing still. She quietly slipped outside and opened the unlocked camper door. And to her surprise, someone was already there. Chapter 2. Magic Camper. That sounds like a lot of fun. Since we're still stuck in winter, maybe you want to take an adventure cross country. The next book I have is called Barkus. What do you think the primary um, animal is in this book? It's by Pat Patricia McLaughlin and illustrated by Mark Bo Boutavant. There's the cover. Meet Barkus. Barkus is loyal. Barkus is generous. Barkus is family. The exuberant Barkus and his lucky young owner twirl and twirl across the pages of this warm and funny early chapter book series from Newbery medal winning um, medal winning Patricia McLaughlin and internationally acclaimed artist Mark Boutavant. And it's a Junior Library Guild selection by Chronicle Books. Book one. Barkus. On a windy day, my favorite uncle, Uncle Everton, knocked on our door. He wore a long plaid overcoat, plaid overcoat and a black wool cap. I've brought you a present, he called. Who's the present for? I asked. You, Nicky, roared Uncle Everton happily, and Uncle Everton held the leash. And at one end was Uncle Everton, and at the other end was a very big brown dog. Oh my, said my mother. He's big, said my father. His name is Barkus, said Uncle Everton. I'll be traveling around the I'll, I'll be traveling around the world and Barkus does not like to travel. He would rather stay with you. I patted Barkus. Barkus is very smart, Uncle Everton said, smartest dog in the whole world. Uh, does he sit? I asked. Barkus sat on my foot. He likes you already, said Uncle Everton. Does he do tricks? I asked. Yes, said Uncle Everton. Many trips. Jump, Barkus. Barkus jumped. Whirl around, said Uncle Everton. Marcus, Barkus whirled and whirled. Does he get along with people, asked my mother. Yes, said Uncle Everton. Does he bark, asked my father. Only when he wants to, said Uncle Everton. Is there anything Barkus doesn't do, I asked. Yes, said Uncle Everton. Barkus doesn't bite. <laughs> Excuse me again. Then I'll keep him, I said. Thank you. You're welcome, said Uncle Everton. And that is how Barkus became my dog. I'd like somebody to drop a dog that's totally trained at my front door. So Barkus sneaks. 
So it's winter for the second chapter. I love the illustrations. I think you should come and check Barkus out. For our advanced chapter books, we have Chasing Vermeer, Blue Balliette, illustrated by Brett. Oh, it's written by Blue Balliette and illustrated by Brett Helquist. It's a scholastic book. And here's the front cover. When a book of unexplainable occurrences brings Petra, Andaly, and Calder Pillay together, strange things start to happen. Seemingly unrelated events connect an old, an eccentric old woman seeks their company, and an invaluable Vermeer painting disappears. Before they know it, the two find themselves at the center of an international art scandal, where no one, neighbors, parents, teachers, is spared from suspicion. As Petra and Calder are drawn clue by clue into a mysterious labyrinth, they must draw on their powers of intuition, their problem-solving skills, and their knowledge of Vermeer. Can they decipher a crime that has left even the FBI baffled? It's a New York Times bestseller, Book Sense Book of the Year, Edgar Award winner, Booklist Top 10 Youth Mysteries, Chicago Tribune Prize for Young Adult Fiction. Suspenseful, exciting, charming, and even unexpectedly moving. The book is a scholastic book. I think I said that. Hmm. Oh, and it starts with a map. That's the key, so when you're in the book, you can find where you are. Okay. Chapter 1, Three Deliveries. On a warm October night in Chicago, three deliveries were made in the same neighborhood. A plump tangerine moon had just risen over Lake Michigan. The doorbell had been rung at each place and an envelope had left been left propped outside. Each front door was opened on to an empty street. Each of the three people who lived in those homes lived alone, and each had a hard time falling asleep that night. The same letter went out to all three. Dear friend, I would like your help in identifying a crime that is now centuries old. This crime has wronged one of the world's greatest painters, as those in positions of authority are not brave enough to correct this error, I have taken it upon myself to reveal the truth. I have chosen you because of your discriminating eye, your intelligence, and your ability to think outside of convention. If you wish to help me, you will be amply rewarded for any risks you might take. You may not show this letter to anyone. Two other people in the world have received this document tonight. And although you may never meet, the three of you will work together in ways none of us can predict. If you show this to the authorities, you will most certainly be placing your life in danger. You will know, you will know how to respond. I congratulate you on your pursuit of justice. The letter was not signed, had no return address. And the man had sat down to a late dinner. He liked to read when he ate. He, and he was on the last, on page four of a new novel. Book in hand, he answered the door. His spaghetti and meatballs were cold by the time he remembered them. He sat at the table for a long time, looking at the first, first at the letter and then out at the moon. Was this a joke? Who would go to the trouble of writing and sending such a letter? It was printed on expensive stationery, the kind you buy if you want to be impressive or pretentious. Should you feel flattered? Suspicious? What did this person want from him? What kind of reward were they talking about? And who was it who knew him well enough to know that he'd say yes? A woman tossed and turned in her bed, her long hair trapping moonlight against the pillow. She was going over lists of names in her mind. The more she thought, the more agitated she became. She was not amused. Could this be a coincidence or was it a clever warning? What exactly did this 
person know about her past? She finally got up a hot cup of hot a cup of hot milk would calm her nerve. She moved carefully in the dark, using the watery rectangles of light that fell across the floor. She wasn't about to turn on the kitchen light. The names scrolled in tidy columns through her mind, each group belonging to a different chapter in her life. There was Milan, there was New York, there was Istanbul. But this was an invitation, not a threat. If things got strange or frightening, she could always change her mind. Or could she? Another woman lay awake under the moon, listening to the wind and the occasional whine of a police siren. This was one of the weirdest coincidences ever. Was this letter insane or inspired? And was she just being gullible, thinking this person was really writing to her? Maybe hundreds of these letters had gone out. Had her name been picked out of a phone book? Fake or not, the letter was intriguing. A centuries-old crime. What could this person be planning? And what about the spooky part? If you show this to the authorities, you will most certainly be placing your life in danger. Maybe this was a maniac, one of those serial killers. She pictured the police going through her apartment and finding the letter, standing over her body and saying, gee, she should have called us first thing. She could have been alive today. A lone cat yowled in the alley below her bedroom, and she jumped, her heart pounding. Sitting up in bed, she shut the window and locked it. How could she not say yes? This was a letter that could alter history. Here's all three of the people. And that ends chapter one. You might have to race me because I might check that one out. That sounds very intriguing and I like art history. And for my last choice, it, um, the book is titled The Cure for Cold Feet by Beth Ain. So there's middle school. So there's long hallways and long lunch tables and long social studies periods and very, with a very certainly annoying boy and um, ballroom dance lessons like ballroom dance has anything to do with social studies. So Izzy's mom got a new friend and Izzy's dad is getting remarried and Izzy's brother is drama and Izzy is kind of stuck in the middle. So what? No biggie. This is what being in the middle feels like for everyone, right? Good thing there's a bathroom stall hideout where she can ride out the good, the bad, the whatever. Find out who she is, who her friends are, who will help thaw Izzy's cold feet and help her dance through the year. Ready or not. The book is a random house book. Middle of nowhere. They say middle school is the worst. Everyone says this, literally. Everyone also says, literally. Mom's new best friend stopped by to say this, um, this thing just tonight. The night before the first day of middle school. Are you excited, she asks. All lit up in the middle of dinner. Are you ready, she asks five minutes later in the middle of my sentence about not being ready. Did you pick out a new outfit, she asks sweetly. In the middle of dessert, I roll my eyes. A new attitude, she asks, looking at me out the sides of her eyes. Mom's new best friend is a yogi, a person who teaches yoga and wears yoga bracelets and leggings and leg warmers that go all the way up to the middle of her thighs. Middle things everywhere. Mom's new best friend is Jasmine Allen, also known as Jackson Allen's mom. Jackson Allen, who is one of four 
annoying boys who made their way through all of elementary school as an annoying gang of fingers slamming people who made fun of any person who got in the middle of it somehow. Jackson is super excited, she says. He's at his dad's tonight, but super, super excited. I wish I were at my dad's tonight, I think, in the middle of her third super. Middle school is not the worst, I think. She is. So starts this book. This book has is almost in written in like a prose because the the, the it almost reads like prose. Um, and I think you would get through this quite quickly. Chapter two is called Drama. <laughs> so if you like school novels, this one will be for you. And if you're in fifth or sixth grade, you're heading to our middle school in West Boylston, which is... Um, sixth, seventh, and eighth, you'll probably appreciate all the torturous things that happen to middle schoolers. So I thank you for listening today, and I hope you enjoyed my picks, and w welcome into the library and check them out. Bye for now.